Shortly after Shireen Abu Akleh was killed, the Israeli government began circulating this video. It shows an armed Palestinian firing his weapon. Israel says it shows how the veteran Al Jazeera correspondent was likely shot by Palestinian gunfire and not by its forces. But that's disputed by rights groups, witnesses and journalists who've analyzed the video. Israel says this is where the Palestinian fighter opened fire. From this point, Jerusalem-based human rights organization Selim says there are too many walls, alleys and buildings blocking the site where Shireen was shot. And GPS verification and dozens of video clips shows this is where Israeli soldiers were located as they raided a home in Jenin. It shows a direct line of fire to where Shireen was shot and killed. The site is also far from the Palestinian resistance fighter who was about 260 meters away. But Selim says Israel's version of events is based on a false narrative designed to protect the perpetrators. There is no line of sight between one location and the other. Uh, and in fact, our researcher, uh, it has taken him a few minutes to walk from one location to the other location. The announcement on an investigation is one of Israel's most uh, tried and unfortunately successful uh, tricks in, in the blanket impunity that Israel provides itself. A witness says Israeli forces were not under attack. When the journalists arrived, they were surprised because the occupation forces were closing the street with their military vehicles, and then they started shooting at them. A man tried once again to retrieve Shireen's body. We were not aware at that point that she had been killed. He tried to provide first aid to her. So they started shooting at him and the bullets hit a tree over his head. The guys here were not throwing stones nor shooting. There was no form of resistance. The European Union has called for an independent investigation into her death. And the U.S. envoy to the U.N. has called for Shireen's killing to be transparently investigated. But Israel has a track record of not punishing its soldiers who have committed crimes against Palestinians. And it's never jailed one of its soldiers for the killing of a journalist. Katia lopez Odoyan, Al Jazeera. With me in the studio now is Abdullah al Aryan. He is an associate professor of history at Georgetown University here in Qatar. Thank you for coming into the studio. Um, people, as we've been saying, people have grown up watching um, Shireen cover these, these huge events in the history of Palestine um, and the Palestinian struggle. How important is that, the witnessing of this? I mean, I think her contribution has been absolutely immense, uh, you know, not to to kind of overstress the point, but she's been covering these events going back decades to the point that she's brought the Palestinian struggle uh, into the lives of millions and millions of people worldwide, especially given that this was really the first truly global uh, news network that was sh uh, showing things from the perspective of people living there on the ground. I think it's also important to, to keep in mind that not only was she covering the obvious, uh, you know, the wars, the, the frequent assaults on Gaza, on people in the West Bank, but she's, she's there covering the daily attacks on people. She's covering the daily uh, struggles with ethnic cleansing, with the, the expansion of settlements over the last two decades, when we consider the fact that ever since the Oslo process began, uh, settlements have more than tripled in the West Bank. And so those kinds of daily affronts to the idea of Palestinians being able to exercise any sort of sovereignty on their own land um, has been covered uh, tremendously by, by Shireen throughout this entire period. Remind our audience of what the Oslo process is, because we've had a few different correspondents talking about it before, but you're a professor of history, so just lay that out for us. Sure. I mean, this is, this is the process that began in, in the early 1990s when there was a, the possibility that there could be a two-state resolution um, to the competing claims over historical Palestine. And yet what we've seen, of course, since then is that all that the Oslo process allowed is for the Palestinians essentially to abandon any sense of attempting to struggle for their liberation and at the same time permitting uh, Israel to continue to expand its, its uh, ethnic cleansing uh, of Palestine. And again, this is a process that began going back to 1948 when the state of Israel was established at the expense of three quarters of a million Palestinians who were um, made refugees overnight. And of course, the remainder of the residents there became uh, either citizens of Israel that received second class uh, citizen treatment, or in the case of Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza who, have, who are actually stateless, but exist under a state of permanent military occupation and continuous uh, colonialism. 
Let's zoom out for a minute and, and just explain to us how it is that this has been allowed to continue for 70 years. Because you have, um, I know they're not a direct comparison, but you have Russia invading Ukraine and you have the, glo the West is resounding in its condemnation and this must end quickly and we will do everything we can. How is it that an occupation like this has been allowed to continue for so long? Well, I think it is in part the responsibility of Western powers who first, going all the way back to the British occupation and, and colonization of Palestine, who permitted for the emergence of a settler colonial movement that was European in its origins to solve a number of the, the problems and the, the forces of kind of discrimination and genocide that were taking place in Europe going back to the 19th and 20th centuries, and at the same time happening at the expense of the indigenous population. And so we've seen a kind of emergence of a settler colonial entity similar to what we've seen, for instance, in South Africa under apartheid. Of course, we've seen now the overwhelming majority of human rights organizations around the world have, have all come to the conclusion of what Palestinians have been saying for decades, which of course is the fact that Israel is exercising an apartheid type control over the lives of Palestinians, both within the state of Israel and also within the occupied territories. There's been no political will on the part of the international community as we know it, whether it's the United Nations, whether it's uh, the U.S., European allies, to try and end this, this situation in any kind of meaningful or just way. Mm. Uh, so I believe we are very uh, shortly expecting the arrival of the, uh, the body of uh, Shireen Abu Akhle. These are live pictures. Obviously, there's a lot of people there, so excuse our, our camera. Uh, they're getting a steady shot. You can see there are uh, the procession coming in. They're carrying their funeral. They're carrying the coffin high on their arms. Uh, I believe we have Steph, Stephanie Decker. Steph, if, if you can hear us, and if you're in a place to do so. Yes. Just, uh, just tell us what's happening there. Let you take in these images. They're trying to open the way, basically. This is, I, the, I think what you're witnessing here is emotion also on part of the journalists. Mm. For them, it's also incredibly personal. Um, people are very emotional here, which is why they're trying, the hospital staff are trying to get people to um, to give space, but, uh, but it's been very difficult. So I think now they're gonna try and just carry the coffin and give it, so, because what they wanted to do was put it down on the bed for 10 or 15 minutes to have people pay their respects. Just letting you take in some of these sims, Kim. Basically, um, they're saying rest in peace, Shireen, as they're now taking the coffin into the morgue. Throwing rose petals on her coffin. Oh, 
Unity Palestine. A lot of emotions here. So basically, her coffin now being taken into the morgue, which is where she will stay. Let's just uh, get a little bit up. Sorry, it's a. So um, we're just going to move away a little bit um, because you can see just the the heightened motions, the chaos that um, the situation was. They've now put her into this gentleman having a rose that were handed out to put um, on the coffin. We are just trying to get some space now. She's been uh, laid into the morgue, which is where. The body will stay until tomorrow. Oh. This is Javada, one of the Al Jazeera Arabic correspondents. My friend, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Do you want to say something for Al Jazeera So, um, incredibly, it's it's incredibly even even Samid's crying. Uh, very difficult to see this um, now that she's arrived here. And everyone, you know, it's hard to keep your emotions together. It's um, she just went to work like everyone does um, and didn't expect to come home like yesterday we were watching her um, her body come back to Ramallah to the office nobody expected in the morning when she sent an email at 6 30 like everybody does that she was going to check uh, on the situation in Janine on a raid to be brought back you know uh, dead and having her colleagues inconsolable around her so this is you know this is the this is I think you've got sadness here there's going to be a lot of anger there is anger um, and I think people will tell you that you know accountability and justice is very difficult uh, under these circumstances under the Israeli occupation she's not the first um, she is the most high profile um, it's uh, yeah it's 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 very difficult all right Steph hey thank you so much for that uh, Stephanie Decker with our team there uh, in occupied East Jerusalem uh, where the body of uh, Shireen has just been taken uh, let's come back to the studio now uh, where we have Abdullah Al Aryan, uh, associate professor of history at Georgetown University in Qatar. Obviously, hugely emotional scenes there, but uh, as we've been saying, not surprising given, uh, I guess, the the depth of her contribution to journalism and to the Arab world. Yeah, absolutely. I think you know it's it's really important to see the kinds of uh, impact that shedding light on these. Uh, on these abuses and these daily atrocities um, can have. And I think, you know, one of the things that we heard yesterday from an Israeli military spokesperson is he said, you know, they're armed with cameras, mm. right? So this is kind of interesting to think about the way that they juxtapose the work of journalists who are just there to kind of shed light and, and try to bring a certain reality to people that often gets uh, covered or, or overlooked. It says um, a lot, doesn't it? Armed with cameras. Absolutely. I think it, it really speaks to the fact that these are targeted killings. And mm. I think we've seen enough evidence of that. In fact, in 2019, a UN commission concluded that Israel was intentionally targeting journalists. And we've mm. seen that this is not an isolated incident. This has occurred uh, dozens of times over the last 20 years. We can point to incidents in which journalists were killed in, you know, in the duty of trying to report on what's happening mm. um, in Israel and, and in Palestine. Yeah. I know that the, uh, the International Federation of Journalists has said Abu Akleh's killing is part of a deliberate systematic targeting of journalists. And like Steph was saying, you know, she was just going to work. She was going to do her job, which she's very passionate about, spreading, shedding light on, on an occupation and everything that that entails for the people of Palestine, doing her job and a, and a job which is um, necessary for, for the world to know what is happening. Mm -hmm. What does history tell us about how Israel is likely to respond, whether there is likely to be any, any justice? Well, history tells us otherwise, certainly, that, that in the course of all of the previous incidents similar to this one, that there's never been any kind of accountability. That normally what these investigations do is they, they ultimately turn into cover-ups, attempts to basically say that, that there was no responsibility. I mean, we've already seen that process begin, right? We've seen the denials, we've seen the recriminations, we've seen issuing of videos that have absolutely no relevance whatsoever to the, uh, to the killing in question. 
Um, we've already seen the kinds of, of uh, types of responses that we can invest from any sort of investigation. And not to mention the fact that these are never in isolated incidents in the sense that it's just simply one person acting, but rather we've seen that there's structural violence involved in the way that the occupation itself functions. And so within that context, it's impossible to ever assume that there can be any kind of a, a uh, you know, an objective or transparent investigation. And so the only real solution to that is to have an international body of some kind that can actually conduct that investigation and then um, hold Israel to account for its actions. And I guess the reporting of that structural violence was something that um, Shireen did because, as we've been saying, you know, among her many assignments were, were the big things covering five wars in Gaza, Israel's war with Lebanon, you know, home evictions, the killings of Palestinian youth, the detention of Palestinian youth, the I I illegal um, Israeli settlements which are continuing to expand, but also those daily things, those daily raids, the impact on, on people when they're displaced. So I guess my question is, you know, how important is it that those stories are told too? Yeah, absolutely, because I think this is one of the problems in terms of the way that the, the media gaze shifts its focus really to the kind of the hot spots and the moments where things are, are really heating up in a specific place and kind of tend to ignore the daily uh, instances of violence in the way that, for instance, the ethnic cleansing that's occurring within Palestine happens in ways that are much more mundane and not as, as kind of camera friendly, so to speak. So just to give you an example, just this past week, an Israeli high court ruled for the eviction of eight Palestinian villages, mm. right? So these are the kinds of things that happen, the home demolitions, things that oftentimes don't get covered in the same way that, that the military, uh, the, you know, the all out military assaults do get covered, I think, much more uh, directly. Um, but even on the media question, I mean, th going back to this question of investigations, we know that last summer, um, the Israeli uh, Air Force bombed uh, a military building, or sorry, rather a media building in, in Gaza that, ha that housed the Associated Press in Al Jazeera. Mm. And that to this day, we still don't have any kind of accountability for that. So I, I don't think that we can necessarily expect the same for this incident. Um, it's quite a big question, but one I think is important for our international viewers who may not... Um you know, be intimately familiar with what we mean when we say life under occupation, what we mean when we say covering, um, you know, covering the impacts of an occupation. So just for, for our international audience, can you explain to us what, what we mean by that? Yeah, what we mean is, is a system in which the, the structures of power don't represent you as a person, right? So the Palestinians don't have any kind of rights or claims under a military occupation. They're simply at the mercy of uh, an occupying force that has been there, at least in the case of the West Bank and Gaza since 1967, that controls every element of their daily life from movement, from what uh, economic opportunities they might have, from access to medical care. We've seen, for instance, um, people die at border crossings because they're unable to access medical care while they're going to try uh, at the checkpoints, rather. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are the kinds of things that exist, the daily humiliations of soldiers that are able to raid homes, that are able to also um, to, to seize homes, to demolish them. Um, and there's no recourse, right? There's no court system from which people can actually claim any sort of relief. Because ultimately, this is a discriminatory system that exists to privilege one population at the, ex at the expense of another. I mean, again, this is where, why the international human rights community has reached this consensus in the last few years to basically say this is very much akin to what we saw in apartheid in South Africa. There are some obvious important differences, but the idea of keeping people separate and discriminating between them on the basis of their ethnicity or their religious background or ethnic background uh, is very much present. I mean, we've seen it even just over the last month with the assaults on the holy sites in Jerusalem, right? That those daily provocations were very much kind of, again, intended to um, remove Palestinian uh, Muslim and Christian rights in Jerusalem. Mm. Which I guess is also one of the reasons why reporting from the ground is, is so important, shining a light on, on all of these daily provocations, these daily humiliations. Um, hey, thank you very much for your time. Uh, we appreciate it. Abdullah Al-Aryan there, an Associate Professor of History at Georgetown University.